next song is Ring Out the Message. I know sometimes you get up here and think, you might think, man, that guy talks a lot. But you should see me at work. <laughs> Joe, Joe raised his hand. <laughs> but uh, I want to say something about this song. Uh, Tim called me and asked if I could leave, and I said, I don't know. But I think I learned this song way back in 1967-ish. I don't know. Who went to camp at Camp Rotary? I mean, that's, yeah, that's why I met some of you people. And we used to hang out. They used to have a little cabin there for the, where we'd go in and get our canteen, you know, and get our, that's where I got my first Mountain Dew. And it still had a hillbilly sitting on a haystack on the front of the bottle. It was different. But uh, a lot of my childhood stuff I remember you know, singing songs at camp, that was some really good times, and I know that still goes on today. And I, I know, I think, that whenever it's my turn to lead singing, I always think back about stuff that happened. I mentioned that about my Uncle Jess, and that was, just, I was pretty young then, too. And we used to gather together at my grandma's house whenever we went, and we'd all get to singing. But uh, I just, uh, this, this one has something, it, it took me back, too way back when all those people were singing out there by the lamp post. So, and if, I, I learned tenor in this song, and I think I can lead it, so I'm counting on you. <clears throat> There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out. It will give them courage new, it will help them to be true. Ring it out, ring it out, ring out the word or land and sea. Let Jesus many live in sin and doubt. Ring out the news. Saving grace, make it known in every place. Ring it out, ring it out. Help the needy ones to know him from whom all blessings flow. Ring it out, ring it out, ring out the word or land and see. Far from Jesus, many live in sin and doubt. Ring out the news that make men free to all the lost of every nation. Sin and not to sweep away till shall dawn the better day. Ring it out, ring it out, till the sinful world be one for Jehovah's mighty Son. Ring it out, ring it out, ring out the word or land. Far from Jesus, many live in sin and doubt. Ring out the news that makes men free to all the lost of every nation. Okay, thanks. I found out I can't lead, sing lead in the chorus, can I?
At this time, we want to make sure we dismiss our children to Children's Church. So you can head downstairs. I want to thank all of you for being here today. I know we have some visitors among us, and so we're really glad you are here. And uh, we're glad all of you are here, really. It's a great turnout. It's got to be one of our largest groups since we've come back together again. And so we're really uh, glad that you're here to worship together today. Yesterday evening, we had a, a pasta dinner downstairs. And uh, it was in support of our teens who are going to Winterfest this week. They'll be leaving later this week. And so um, I just wanted to recognize our teens because you guys did a great job of serving. Uh, really appreciate what you did last night and, and uh, appreciate those who took care of preparing the food. And so uh, we just wish you all well this week and safe travels and just want to thank you for the job you guys did last night. And I think it's okay we can applaud a little bit. It'll be fine. So. So I, I did find out, though, that um, you know last night at our table, Sawyer Nicosia was our server. So she came and served us throughout the whole night. So I saw her this morning. I came in. I asked her if she could get me an egg McMuffin and uh, a hash brown and, and a diet coke. And she's like, yeah, "We don't we don't do that anymore." So I, I I thought she would be the server for life for me, but apparently that wasn't part of the deal. So, but uh, it was really a great time. We had a great turnout and and. Obviously, we wish uh, them the very best. It'll be uh, a great experience for them uh, coming up this week. So a young minister was uh, preaching his first sermon at a congregation. He was actually trying out there for the full-time minister position. And so the sermon that he preached that day when he was trying out was, was very well received. He got a lot of uh, praise and, and just appreciation at the end of the service when people were leaving the, the, the church building. and. Uh, they really had uh, approved of what he had, had to say, and so um, it went very well. Well, he got hired, and when he preached his first sermon as the official minister, he preached the exact same sermon that he preached when he was trying out. And it's like, okay. Well, he did that for the next three Sundays, the same sermon. So there were some concerns from some of the members and, and some curiosity from, from the elders of that congregation. And so they approached the young man and, and asked whether he or not he had any other sermons. And he said yes, that he did. And so they, they asked him why he kept repeating the first sermon. And so he, he responded this way. He, he asked them a question in response. And the question was this. He says, well, have you put into practice the message of the first sermon that I preached? And unfortunately, they admitted that they had not. So his response to that was this. Well, why should I move on and preach another sermon until you've actually embraced the message of the first one and put it into practice? They were embarrassed. And of course, they had no answer to that question. In essence, that's what James is writing about in James chapter 1 verses 22 to 25, which is what we're going to be looking at today. You see, last week we talked about listening. We talked about the importance of listening and building relationships. But also we talked about how if we don't listen and we're quick to speak and quick to become angry, that can destroy relationships or can cause relationships never to form in the first place. Well, James continues that thought from last week to what we're going to look at this week in verses 22 to 25. He's writing again to these Jewish Christians in the first century that have been scattered all over the place. And, and it's, it's important, it's even critical, I think, that, that we focus on listening. And that's what he talked about and we talked about last week. That we listen to God's word, but also, you know, last week we talked about listening to one another. But he stresses the importance of listening to God's word, but he goes even a step further than just listening or hearing God's word. In fact, he said that, that we need to pay attention to it, that we need to apply it, that we need to, to make it part of who we are, that we don't just hear the words that are spoken. And so that's the essence of, of what he wrote in these three or four verses that we're going to read in just a minute. Um, and, and I think maybe as we read through that, we may find that some of the trials that James wrote about early in that first chapter 
that the Christians were having, they may have been some self-inflicted trials. And you know, there are times, maybe sometimes when we have issues and troubles, whether it's personally or even as a church, that they could be self-inflicted as well. So I think there's some lessons that we can learn individually as well as a church from just those four verses that we're going to look at now in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. And so the title really, the, my thoughts today are learning by doing. And so here's what James had to say. He said this, he said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He goes on to say this, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. In reality, James is saying this. He says, don't fool yourself. You can listen to God's word being taught. You can hear my letter, James's letter, being read over and over and over again. But that's not enough. He says, until you begin doing what it says to do, you're going to forget it. And ultimately, by forgetting it, Here's what else you're going to do. You're going to waste the teaching that was presented to you. You're going to waste the listening effort that you put forth. And you're going to waste the power of the message if you don't put it into practice. I don't know about you, but I learn better by doing. And, and the more that I do something, the, the more I learn how to do it and how to do it better. Uh, the more thoroughly I can learn by, by doing it. I mean, you can, you can tell me how to do something. You can even show me how to do something. You can give me a diagram of how to do something, but until I do it myself and do it again and again, I'm never going to learn it. That's just me, but I think that's also maybe human nature. And I'll never have hope of mastering it unless I put it into practice. So that's really kind of what James is saying. I mean, the same could be said, too, I think, sometimes for how we approach God's word. I mean, the messages that we hear and hopefully that we listen to, the, the words we read from the Bible, just how effective or ineffective are they based on whether we hear and whether we listen and whether we take in what we've been taught. Well, you may say, well, why is that so important? I mean, I, I come here and... I sit for an hour or so and I listen and, you know, I go home and, I mean, that should be enough, right? Well, Paul wrote this and he wrote this in 2 Timothy, beginning chapter 3, he said, and I think in writing this he's kind of given us a reason why it is important that we do more than just listen. He said, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it's not just about just listening and hearing and reading. It's about what we do with what we listen to, what we read, and what we've been taught. I mean, what a, what a practical lesson that James provides that first century group of Christians. What a practical lesson that they can use. And what a practical lesson he applies and provides to us as the 21st century Christians. I mean, I want you to consider this with me for a minute. Would we be comfortable? Would we be okay with all the other drivers on the road having read the handbook, but never practiced actual driving before they got their license? Probably not. Would we be okay if our surgeon who is about to perform surgery for uh, on us sat in a lecture hall and listened to a professor but never practiced any hands-on practice at all of surgery before they put us under to do surgery. Would that be okay with us? Probably not. Or, and Sammy's here today, I'm not picking on you honey, but she's here. Would you want a barber or a hairstylist to pick up a pair of scissors to cut your hair if all they'd ever done is read the directions on the box. 
you know, they get a little, I, I don't think I'd like that. We would like them to have some practice. We would like them to have applied what they'd been taught. Just like the person that comes to, to install our furnace and our air conditioning unit, and if they say, well, you know, somebody explained this, how to do this once to me, a long time ago, so I got this. We probably wouldn't like that either. And the same is true with God's word and what we do with it. You know, James compares a hearer only to someone who can't remember what they saw in the mirror. It'd be like, okay, here's a mirror. I'm like, oh man, I'm looking good. And then I turn away and I'm like, I don't, did I have my hair combed? Did I have a mustache? I don't remember. And it's constantly forgetting. Well, that's his comparison. It's like, as soon as we see something, we forget it. Well, if that's how we treat God's word, that's not good either. He suggests, I think, too, in, in, in having that happen and forgetting what we've heard immediately, forgetting it, two things really take place. The hearer only doesn't value the truth of God's word. If they forget it right away, how can they value the truth found in God's word? And then the second thing would be the hearer only doesn't apply the message of God's word if they forget it right away. So James is really encouraging those who he's writing to to do more than just hear the word, to do more than just be present and then forget what you've been taught. Um, I think James could have easily said this, maybe if he was writing to the 21st century Christians, but he could have said, you know, don't just sit on those pews or in those seats and hear the message of the songs that were sung and, and the prayers that were led and the communion that was taking place. And don't just listen to the Bible being read or the Bible being taught and then when the final amen comes and you walk out the door, boom, it's gone. I forgot it. He's saying don't do that. That's not effective. That doesn't do us any good. And so, again, I think believers who hear the word of God, we've got to receive it with a teachable spirit. And we've got to receive it with a heart that's committed to wanting to know what God wants of us and what God expects of us. You know, Paul would write again, this time in Colossians, he says this, he says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There was a man who sat in a worship service, uh, and he heard this incredible sermon about brotherly love. And as he exited the, the auditorium, he, he vigorously shook the minister's hand and thanked him so much and told the minister, that may have been the best sermon I've ever heard on brotherly love. And I really needed that, he told him. And then he proceeded out of the building and into the parking lot. And when he got into the parking lot, he noticed that somebody had clipped the rear bumper of his car when they were parking. So he waited for that person to see who it was. And when that person came out, he grabbed the guy by the arm and he hit him right in the face. <laughs> what happened to the message? What happened to the listening? What happened to the application? What happened to the doing? As soon as he walked out of the building, it was gone. He had an opportunity to apply everything that he had heard about brotherly love and apply it to that situation in the parking lot, but he chose not to. Here's what I think is, has some truth to it. Listening can become a waste of time, resulting in an absence of learning when there's an absence of doing. Oh, look at that again. You might be thinking, okay, get my arms around it. Listening beca can become a waste of time, resulting in an absence of learning, and how could that happen? Well, it happens when there's an absence of doing, an absence of putting into practice what we've heard, what we've listened to. You know, James is really making, I think, the importance of putting the message into practice very clear in verse 25 that we read a minute ago. Because he basically says when he gets to verse 25 about that guy that looks in the mirror and forgets, don't do that. He says instead of listening and forgetting, 
and in many cases ignoring what the Bible says, what God's word says. He says, examine it, study it, look intently into it. In essence, James is referring, when he says look intently, he's saying, take this penetrating look into God's word, into the perfect law of liberty. And we know that Jesus talked to us in Matthew 26 about that law, that, that law of love, that perfect law, the love that, that God had and, and how we should be loving God and, and loving others as well. And Jesus taught that. And, and the love that we find in Jesus really gives us freedom. It gives us freedom from sin, but it also gives us freedom to truly love others. Not only in word, but in things that we do. In actions that we take toward others. I think, I think by, by studying, by ingesting, taking in the message of God's perfect law, we're going to come to know what God wants of us. We're going to come to know what it is that he expects of us, what we can do in service to him, in loving him, but also in how we can love others as well. And, and, he, and James goes on to say, if we do that, if we really pay attention to God's word, here's what we get. We'll be blessed. And he wrote that to those first century Christians, but the same is true for us. If we take God's word and we put it into practice and we make it part of who we are, James says, we'll be blessed. And I truly believe that. There was a bird nest that was sitting outside the patio window, and, and there were baby birds in the nest, and the mama bird would come, and, and the baby birds would always have their mouth open so that the mama bird could feed them. And so day after day, that's what they would do. But at some point in time, the baby birds had to learn how to feed themselves. They had to learn how to build their own nest, how to find their own food. I think as Christians, there are times maybe when, when we come and, and we come to a Bible class or we come to a worship service and we, we come with the point of, well, just feed me, feed me. And there's nothing wrong in essence with that except that if we don't do anything the other six days after we've been fed, then we're starving ourselves spiritually for six days. Could any of us here go without food for six days. Now I know Ron did, but he didn't do it by choice. But it's gonna, it's gonna harm our body if we don't eat for six days. Well, it's gonna harm us spiritually if we choose not to take God's word and take it in more than just one day a week. So I think it's important that, that we take a look internally at ourselves and say, okay, what am I doing with God's word? Is it something I read before I go to bed and then the next morning I don't remember? Is it something that I hear occasionally in a Bible class or a worship service? But then, you know, it's good to hear it, but I don't really do anything with it. That's not what God wants for us. That's not what James really is writing about. And so I think it's critical. You know, it's kind of like this, okay? It's kind of like what James wrote. It's kind of like, here's what he's doing. He's saying, First century Christians, this is James. Uh, maybe some of your trials are a result of you refusing to do what God says to do. Do you want to be blessed? Well, try listening. Try applying. Try learning and try doing. But he doesn't stop there. Because here's what happens. He says, 21st century Christians, this is James. Maybe some of your trials are a result of you refusing to do what God's word says to do. Do you want to be blessed? Try listening, applying, learning, and doing. You see, James started out by saying this in verse 22. He said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Now, I got to tell you, I am so proud and so pleased and excited about all the work that is done and continues to be done here in North Park. About the love that continues to be shown not only to one another here, but to others who come here or who we learn about who need us, who need God's love outside of the group that meets here. And I know a lot of that goes on. And so you might say, well, Tim, why are you preaching that sermon then? We're already doing that. Well, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm with you. 
But here's the thing. If we're not doing anything, Satan's going to ignore us because we don't have it. We don't pose a threat to him. But if we're doing what we're doing now, he's going to figure out a way to disrupt that because that goes against what he wants to see done. And so instead of being cautious and saying, well, maybe I better slack off, I want to encourage us, those who are doing, to keep doing and to keep doing more and more, to take the message of God's word and to find opportunities to say, here's how I'm going to take that and use it in my life. Whether it's to make myself a better person or to help somebody else that's in need. And, and if, it's, if there are those that aren't doing that or maybe they're a little hit and miss, I want to encourage you to keep stepping up your game. Because there are people in this auditorium who need our love. And there are people outside this auditorium, outside this city, outside this country who need our love. And they need to not only be told that they're loved, but they need to feel and see that they're loved. And so James is just saying, hey, here's, here's the crux of it all. There's some powerful messages in God's word, but it loses its power if we do nothing with it. So let's take what we are taught, what we read, what we learn, and let's put it into practice so that it can benefit so many other people, including God. And guess what? We'll be blessed because of it. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Let's do what it says. Thank you.